Thank you so much, uh, uh, Matthew, Elif, and Tuba for the invitation. And thank you all of you today that are here to listen to me. Let me share my... Right. Oops. Okay. So Delos underwent a rapid economic development after 167 BC when Romans granted the port city of Delos duty-free status under Athenian dominion and turned it into a commercial base connecting the Eastern and Western Mediterranean. The island became a free, oh, sorry. Right. right, so this was the slide actually I wanted to have on. Um, so it turned into a commercial base connecting the Eastern and Western Mediterranean. The island became a free trade commercial base under nominal Athenian supervision, but essentially under Roman rule. The result of this economic development was an unprecedented population increase and by consequence, an accelerated urbanization, attested by the formation of new neighborhoods and harbor facilities, and the redevelopment of existing urban and harbor areas of the island. The urban form of Delos was constantly transformed in order to accommodate the growing needs of its emporium and provides a unique case study of Roman urbanism, of Hellenistic and Roman urbanism, as it showcases the ways in which the dynamic economy of Greek and Roman cities affected their urban form. As as with so many other early expressions of Roman art, architecture, and religion, evidence on the island by the veristic portraits of Roman merchants, armored statues of Roman generals, the portico gardens of the Italian community, as well as the ubiquitous cult of the Laris, the urbanism of Delos as well provides a unique portal to the architectural and cultural mannerisms of the Roman period. Now, although Delos is a key site in the history of the nascent Roman Empire and numerous archaeological excavations have probed the city of Delos for over a century. The nature and history of urbanism on Delos and the ways in which the city and its harbors accommodated its emporium in the late Hellenistic period remain surprisingly an understudied topic. Only preliminary thoughts have been expressed in the urbanization of Delos, while the single comprehensive study on the urban growth of the island has been rightly criticized for misapplying modern urban planning principles and quantitative methods. While there have been studies of the areas and individual buildings built during the economic development of the island, as well as the cultic observances of the Italian mercantile community in public squares, sanctuaries, private clubhouses and houses, there has been no attempt to synthesize this material within the urban context of the city. My analysis of the urban development of late Hellenistic and Roman Delos seeks to provide an alternative approach to the study of classical urbanism. The field of urban studies in, Greek, in the Greek and Roman periods has experienced rapid developments in the last 25 years with a growing number of multidisciplinary scientific analysis that are being integrated in the study of classical urbanism. We now we know more ancient Greek and Roman cities and we know them better than we ever did before. Although our knowledge of the classical urban environment has increased, our conceptual tools in understanding the processes that formed it have not been correspondingly advanced. The problem is not that there has been a lack of methodological approaches, but precisely the opposite, the abundance of them. The field of contemporary urban studies that can postulate novel conceptual tools for the analysis of such complex sets of data has been to date absent from these relatively recent exciting developments. By focusing on the city of Delos, my aim is to establish the overdue interdisciplinary links between the fields of archaeology and urban studies. In this paper, I analyze the ways in which the city of Delos developed in order to accommodate its emporium and propose a theoretical framework for the study of the classical urban environment. By addressing the relationship between economic and social change and urban growth on late Hellenistic Delos, my analysis aims to contribute to current theoretical debates about ancient urbanism. The urban form of Delos, as in of any other city, did not result merely from a single planning initiative, but from 
consecutive decisions and actions of both private and public sectors. By analyzing the transformation of the city in relation to the physical infrastructure of the Dillian Emporium, its associated micro-scale economic activities, as well as the self-representation of the ambitious Italian mercantile community, I aim to shed light on the dynamic character of the rapid urban development of Delos in relation to the economic, social, and more broadly cultural changes of the period. Whereas this paper focuses on a specific case study of urban growth, its ultimate goal is to offer an alternative approach. The rapid urbanization of Delos may be compared with that of Ostia and Portus, the harbor of Rome, as well as Rome itself. And these in turn may be compared with far more accelerated developments of growing commercial centers of Asia and the Gulf region, developments which are central to contemporary discussions on urbanism. By examining the evolving agents, relationships, and consequences of the rapid urbanization on Delos, this case study identifies a model of urban growth that to date has been overlooked in the study of classical urbanism, of classical urbanism which has focused on the idealized concepts of the Hellenistic and Roman urban environments. Now, studies of Greek and Roman cities have traditionally focused on two aspects, the study of town planning, characteristic urban architecture and physical infrastructure, and two, the study of the city's economic and social organization and administration, including the crucial role of benefaction. The former approach, which is concerned with urban form, examines urban planning principles, such as the hippodamian orthogonal grid and its adjustments to fit the topographical realities of sites using a top-down approach to urban form. It fails to recognize that ancient cities, like contemporary ones, are shaped by economic and sociopolitical factors, factors that are studied separately in the second approach. While some overlap occurs, where some overlap occurs when examining, for example, the city's physical infrastructure, these two approaches have been traditionally treated as distinct ways of analyzing ancient cities. And there has been no attempt to relate urban form to economic developments, public administration, and private initiatives. Recently, studies have addressed the integration of economic activities in Hellenistic and Roman cities, the dynamic character of urban space in classical antiquity, and the socio-political factors that informed it, as well as the need to integrate methods from the natural sciences in exploring the evolution of urbanism and urban networks. The micro-region project of the DIE is one of them. Although these studies go beyond the idealized concepts of the Hellenistic and Roman urban environments to address the multivalent character of ancient cities, they do not examine the ways in which activities in the micro scale of the city save its macro scale. So today I'm interested in analyzing the ways in which economic factors shape the port city of Delos towards the end of the second century BC, when a predominantly Italian community of merchants settled on the island in order to take advantage of the lucrative economic opportunities that arose by the decision of the Roman Senate to make Delos a free port of trade. By analyzing the transformation of the city in relation to the physical and maritime infrastructure of the Delian Emporium, as well as its associated micro-scale economic activities, my aim is to shed light on precisely the dynamic character of the rapid urban development of Delos in this crucial period of the nascent Roman Empire. The small settlement of the Hellenistic period on Delos, which uh, clustered around the main sanctuary uh, area where you see here around the circle, uh, exploded during uh, the late Hellenistic period to satisfy the needs of the increasing population. The urbanization expanded from the area of the old sanctuary center outwards. The new markets clustered on the, at the borders of the sanctuary that you see them here. The central harbor facilities expanded to the south. You see here those uh, uh, commercial buildings to the south of the building and storage facilities were created next to them, forming distinctive maritime, a distinctive maritime facade. Houses clustered next to the sanctuary in the old neighborhood of the theater district uh, indicated here, and new residential neighborhoods were created next to natural harbors, probably to complement the activities of the main harbor that was overloaded by the maritime traffic going through the island in this period. 
I will return to this point later in my paper. Not all the areas of the island have been excavated, but the extension of the city has been recorded in the recent survey of the island that Jean-Charles Moretti conducted for the new map of Delos that has been uh, published. And the analysis and the analysis of drawn images by Philippe Fress and Lionel Fandon provide a better image of the city at this time. You see here the results. Now, the main harbor of uh, the area of the main harbor is where the activities in relation to the wholesale trade of Delos, uh, of Delos took place. The Agora of Theophrastos here was the place for the auctions of the Delian Emporium while the Agora of the Competaliaste, here the place for revictualing the ships. A circular structure here in the Agora of Theostrasus, which is now submerged in the sea, was the place where enslaved people who were traded on Delos, as we know from the sources, as well as merchandise were sold. Enslaved people and merchandise were placed in the center of a circular structure. You see here the entrance to it. And interested individuals could place bids. The enslaved people could have been, could, excuse me, could have been bought, brought ashore in small groups, sold, and then put back on board the ship. This meant there was no need to create specific space on the island with the assigned function of keeping enslaved people as entailed by the notion of a slave market. The Agora of Competaliaste at the south side of the main harbor zone here centered around the Italian Collegia of the Competaliaste, the trade associations of the Italian and Roman merchants on Delos. The volume standards for liquids found in the shops of this area and accompanying inscriptions indicate that the square and adjoining shops were dedicated for selling oil and wine. As the volume standards found in this area have a significantly larger capacity than the ones found in the shops inside the district, uh, further to this, you know, to this area. These measures were used for calculating the oil and wine for the ship's food supplies. Now, while the activities of the Emporium of Delos took place in the main harbor zone, the residential neighborhoods accommodated a network of small scale economic activities, which you see here, that were developed due to the operation of the trading port. The creation of two new neighborhoods next to natural harbor shows on the one hand the growth of the population at this time and on the other the need for more spaces next to harbor facilities. The two new neighborhoods, the Scardana and Stadium districts, were created some decades after the operation of the Entrepot of Delos next to the two natural harbors. The Scardana district was built around 130 BC and the Stadium district towards the end of the first century BC. Both neighborhoods went out of use in 69 BC when the pirate Athenadoros sacked the island. So the Scardana district was occupied for 60 years and the Stadium district for 40 years, roughly. Numerous changes were conducted over this relatively short period of time, which is telling about the dynamic character of the economic activities on the island in this period. In the following, I will address this dynamic character excuse me, the dynamic character. By analyzing the ways in which owners transformed their houses in order to accommodate commercial, manufacturing and storage uses. The common arrangement of Delian houses was to have a large luxurious room with direct access from the peristyle, which I have indicated here in red. In modern scholarship, it has been given the name Oecus Maior. This room then provided access to one or two smaller rooms, which has been uh, called uh, oeki, uh, oecus minor, you know, these are oeki minores. Although, these, all this, although this arrangement can be noticed in the majority of the Delian houses, quite a few houses do not fit into this scheme. Recent studies have gone beyond this early typological analysis to address modern housing units, among other things, but they have not recognized that the changes in the architectural organization of the Delian houses were a result of the growing urban economy of the city of Delos. The prime example for the integration of economic activities in the private sphere is the House of the Seals in the Scardana district, which was destroyed by a fire in 69 BCE, and therefore its archaeological remains have been well preserved. This house was originally 
organized according to the traditional scheme of oecus maior and oecus minor that you see on the left, and was enlarged and remodeled in subsequent phase that you see on the right. The east side was extended and reorganized in order to accommodate a shop and a workshop for the production of grain, wine, and perhaps oil, while the western part of the house was also enlarged and reorganized. The traditional oecus maior was connected to a room of the adjacent house or a public space, we don't know. Uh, and in this new organization, a group of rooms was formed that was accessible from the court through uh, this room, Theta uh, with accent, uh, indicated here the group with yellow. This group of rooms could have been granted out in order to run a business individually. The large number of ceramic shirts and 20 amphora that were found in this room here, Lambda, and the furniture placed along this east wall of this room, Kappa, suggest that these spaces were used for storage. The storage could have served activities that took place in the adjoining uh, group of rooms, the shop and workshop on the, in the eastern part of the house, or the residence of the upper floor of the house. A personal archive of 16,000 seals came from the upper floor, which gave the house its name. Most of the seal, seals bear names of well-known Italian families of Delos, a fact that suggests that the owners were Italian bankers and merchants. The larger-than-life bus coming from the upper floor could be the celebrated Roman bankers Lucius Alfidius Bassus, father and son. The archaeological identification of a workshop in the case of the House of the Seals indicates the type of information we lack in other houses of Delos. In addition, the exceptional survival of the seals from the upper floor points to how misleading the modest ground floor plan of a house can be. While the limited ground floor served a workshop and shop, the upper floor housed a very successful banker involved in the Delian commerce. Similar changes to the original organization of the scheme of Oecus Maior and Oecus Minor are noted in a number of houses. And I will show you an example from the stadium district located in the northeastern part of the island here. In this case, zooming in, the ground floor of the house featured two adjacent Oeci Maiores, which were divided into smaller rooms in a second phase. In this new arrangement, Two groups of rooms were formed that could accommodate workshop and or commercial activities I have indicated here with red. The changes in the architectural organization of these houses allow us to identify some choice and possibly an architectural scheme. We notice that the changes conducted in a subsequent phase created groups of rooms that could function independently. These groups of rooms could accommodate commercial, manufacturing and storage facilities and possibly guest rooms that would have been rented out. Furthermore, it is important to note that the houses were originally designed with the organization of Oecus Maior and Oecus Minor following the typological scheme I explained earlier, and were then modified to form these groups of rooms. A variation to this design decision was to keep the original architectural organization and extend the house in order to add a group of rooms. I will show you an example from the theater district at the bottom of the slide. The original organization of this house was kept and an area of the adjacent house was taken over to form a separate group of forums that were accessible by a single entrance. In some cases, such additions occupied the public spaces. For example, the subsequently added workshops and storage space of these two houses took over in the Scardinand, they took over part of the street. In order to accommodate the growing need for commercial manufacturing and storage facilities, another option was to preserve the internal organization of the house and simply employ some of the space of the house for workshop and storage uses. For example, these houses retained their spatial organization and were transformed into a perfume workshop, an oil workshop, and a marble workshop. In these cases, the owners used the available space to accommodate their needs and there was no architectural reorganization. To sum up, in order to accommodate commercial manufacturing and storage uses, house owners employed two solutions. The first one was to keep the original architectural organization of the house on the ground floor and use part or all of the available space for such uses. It is the case of this house, for example, and the second solution was to modify the original organization of the ground floor 
In this case, the larger rooms on the ground floor were broken down to form smaller rooms, and sometimes extra rooms were subsequently added to the house by occupying the streets or taking over areas of adjacent houses. By transforming the original organization of the houses, owners created new spatial arrangements in order to generate profit in the dynamic economy of the island in this period. These changes were implemented reactively in order to fit the needs of the inhabitants and their commercial activities, the scale of which was not foreseen. A critical element in understanding this development of the commercial cityscape of Delos is the identity of the house owners. Most of the new residents of Delos at this time were from the Italian peninsula, and it is interesting to note that the house where we notice the second solution, that is the organization, reorganization of the ground floor, belonged to Italian merchants. How can we discern their identity? Although the architecture of the Italian house does not reflect the origin of their occupants, Italian houses are distinguished more clearly than any other group through the altars of the Lares Compitales, featuring the so-called liturgical paintings that mark their entrances. The people who are represented in these paintings are clearly Italians. There were togas and calque at their feet and the sacrifice ritu romano with veiled head. The names inscribed above or below these representations indicate that they are slaves and freedmen, mainly from the Eastern Mediterranean. The most plausible interpretation is that they were enslaved people and freedmen of Italian families. And some of these liberty must have managed the affairs of their patrons on Delos. For example, excuse me, this is the close-up of these uh, uh, paintings with uh, Capi de Velato. Um, for example, the liberty of Quintus Tullius that erected a statue in honor of the patron in house, in this house, in the stadium district, uh, uh, as documented in this bilingual inscription. And we see bilingual inscriptions often on Delos, employing the Greek language as a lingua franca, and at the same time, ascertaining the Roman identity. I will briefly mention that from the way that Italians and Romans are mentioned in the, inscription, in the inscriptions, it seems that the term Romaios had a very broad sense. In some inscriptions, Romaios could designate a Roman citizen, but in others it was applied to anyone who came from Italy. Some Italians called themselves Romaio because it was an easier identification. It seems that professional interests united Romans and Italians on Delos under the label Romans, not as Roman citizens, but as an ethnic group. The adoption of the cult of the Lares Compitales, which made reference to Rome, enabled the integration, the integration of this socially mixed group into an Italian ethnic group, and thus served as a means of its self-affirmation. And while the facades of the house of Italian merchants reinforced the identity of the ethnic group by referring to the worship of the Lares Compitales, the interiors of their homes were shaped to meet their economic needs, as we saw earlier. The rearrangement of the ground floor of the houses in order to accommodate economic activities that we discussed was combined with an upper floor where the luxurious residence of the owner was at this phase moved. This is the case of both the House of the Seals in the northern quarter and the house ID here, uh, the bottom one, in the stadium district. And it is from the upper floors of the houses that sculptures, inscriptions, as well as decorative wall paintings come. And this sketch here may serve to illustrate the ways in which such sculptures, sculptures featured in the house. The, the houses where we notice this combination of luxurious upper floor with commercial activities on the ground floor belong to Italian merchants. And I propose that this was not random. By creating luxurious living and reception rooms above a ground floor that served the needs of their growing economic activities, Italian merchants accomplished two things. They made profit and at the same time demonstrated their profit to their customers. The combination of profit with luxury is a well-known Roman architectural strategy attested in houses and villas in Italy, dating slightly later, roughly after the middle of the first century BC. In Roman villas, for example, luxurious spaces were combined with economic concerns of the land. To quote Nicholas Purcell, agriculture and elegance served as, quote, alternative forms of display, end quote. 
It is in this context that we must understand the new organization of the House of the Italian Merchants on Delos. While the activities on the ground floor accommodated their economic needs, the luxurious residents on the upper floor satisfied their social aspirations. Both the architectural organization of the houses and the decoration of their facades that were employed for the self-affirmation of the identity of the affluent Italian merchants of Delos were similar to the slightly later developments in the urban economy and society of early imperial Italy. While the layout of the houses associated the social status of the owners with their professional interests, the altars of the Lares Compitales standing next to the entrance of their houses rendered this ethnic group omnipresent in the commercial cityscape of Delos. The ubiquity of the paintings of the Lares Compitales adorning the walls and altars at the house entrances is striking in the urban landscape of Delos. These religious paintings not only emphasize the identity of the ethnic group in the commercial cityscape of Delos, Delos, excuse me, within this network of economic activities, but also strengthened the bonds of this community and its urban port economy. With the agora of the Compitaliaste, one of the two major public commercial spaces of Delos where the public monument of the Lares Compitales stood. In this way, Italian merchants generated profit through the dynamic economy of Delos, at the same time articulated and asserted their identity, which largely depended on their economic activities. Now, we already noted that the new neighborhoods were formed in relation to small natural harbors. The changes in these new neighborhoods show the inhabitants' constant effort to make the best of the available spaces near the harbor areas. The capacity of the harbors of these neighborhoods were, was significantly smaller and could, could accommodate smaller boats. We may speculate that in the case of this smaller harbor facility, smaller in size and lighter in weight goods, such as perfumes, unguents, incense, gems, and dyes were being loaded on the boats as supplementary to their main cargo. Until recently, however, these smaller harbors were not considered important for the Delian Emporium and research had focused on the main harbor. The recent underwater investigation of the submerged areas of the Stadion and Skartanet district, a collaboration between the effort of underwater antiquities and the National Hypnotic Research Foundation has proved otherwise. This is the first of two surveys that you know, were conducted on Delos. The survey showed that the small that small harbors operated both in the Bay of the Stadium District and the Bay of the Scardana District, complementing the activities of the main harbor. In the Scardana District, a rectangular structure, now submerged, served as a boat dock, probably reinforcing the qualities of the natural harbors and providing a safe anchorage at the north side of the bay. In the Stadium District, on the other side of the island, here where we were looking at these other the houses, a big commercial building with storage facilities that we located in the sea, similar to those found to the south of the main harbor, indicate that, there were large, that the, this maritime facade was also fronted with commercial buildings, like the ones that we see on the south of the harbor. Whereas previous research had focused on the main harbor area, assuming that the Emporium of Delos depended solely on a single harbor, the underwater survey project provided a different picture of the ways in which the port city functioned. But let's now consider the approach to a navigation around Delos. The seas around Delos are relatively deep. The channel between Renia and Delos reaches a, a, a depth of 50 meters and a strong north-south current runs through it, which can often change unexpectedly. The rocky shores are generally steep underwater, apart from the sandy areas of the west coast. The two islets of Great and Small Rematiaris offer protection from the northern winds, but can also be hazardous for navigation. When anchoring in the channel, modern sailing ships use Renia, or the southern part of the channel, where the currents and the winds become milder. There are a few dangerous reefs around Delos. To the south, the Hieronisi, that you see here, and to the north, the Kakoa Krotiri here. 
The approach to Delos is done today mainly via the channel, the channel here. But in the past, and the modern and the uh, people and boats uh, go to the main harbor here. But in the past, according to the accounts of European travelers, all harbors and anchorages of the island were used. Travelers also mentioned that larger ships could easily anchor in the deep waters of the channel and disembark their passengers with smaller boats, where, whereas maps of the 18th and 19th centuries mark the area to the south of Ramatiaris here uh, as a good anchorage. These accounts, rather actually not here, but rather here to the south of the big Ramatiaris. Uh, uh, these accounts seem to corroborate the idea of a harbor network around Delos and within the channel between Renia and Delos. The main harbor is approached, was easily approachable from the northern half of the channel between Renia and Delos and was in Delos and was well protected. Its, its capacity, however, was limited as it originally covered an area of about 2,000 square meters. Only ships of very small capacity could enter it. The merchant harbor was easily approachable from the southern part here, between, uh, 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 between Renia and Delos, Delos, an area that the old nautical maps indicate as a good anchorage. The whole area that can be considered a part of an extension of the commercial harbor, commercial harbor being here, covers a space of 23, thousand square meters from the Great Ramatiaris to the Asclepion Peninsula here, this area. The shallow depth of the main and commercial harbors, the main commercial, the main and the commercial harbors, suggest that larger ships anchored in the deep waters of the channel beyond these areas, protected from Ramatiaris and Renia, and unloaded their goods with smaller boats, probably local boats on the island. The Scardana and Stadion Bays, on the other hand, although more exposed, could accommodate ships of larger capacity more easily. The Scardana Bay uh, uh, covered an area of about 1,000 square meters and had a depth of two meters. It had a serious drawback, however, as it was exposed to the prevailing north winds. Only the small northern promontory could offer some shelter to a few ships anchored here. Ships could anchor there until their cargoes were unloaded and then seek shelter within the channel between Renia and Delos. A similar situation is noticed for the bay next to the stadium district. Being an open anchorage, this bay remained exposed and ships would have, been, would have to keep a safe distance from the coast. But it was a deep and spacious area of about 20,000 square meters, which could have accommodated ships of larger capacity also. To this end, we are able to gouge the operation of the Delian Emporium vis-a-vis -vis its network of harbors, boats of larger capacity anchored in the main channel between Renia and Delos and unloaded their goods via locally managed smaller boats, transferring only part of the cargo, the sample or daima, for auctioning in the main harbor area or directly to the merchant harbor for storage and the facilities there. If the channel between Delos and Renia was too busy and weather permitted, they could approach the Scardana Bay or the Stadium Bay in order to unload their goods and do business there. Furthermore, if we consider the maritime routes connected to Delos, we notice that approaching Delos from the east, same from Ephesus here, the Stadium District, located uh, to the east of the Island is a more amenable harbor. In fact, this harbor is a better cho choice if one needs to avoid the strait between Mykonos and Delos and Delos, which is very difficult to cross with strong Etesian winds, the prevailing northern winds. Similarly, the harbor of Skardana district is a better choice when coming from the north, say from Chalkis. Uh, excuse me say from Halkis from here and approaching Delos and facing south winds, which are not as often, but really powerful when they occur. The operation of the Emporium of Delos depended on a network of harbors that I am showing you here. 
The results of the underwater survey suggest therefore that the bays of the stadium district and the Skardana district served as anchorages around the island, allowing skippers to avoid crossings in difficult weather conditions, thus facilitating the busy emporium of Delos in the late Hellenistic period. Although the mechanisms of trade were weighted towards direct preferential links between emporia ports rather than towards random constant tramping or cabotage, an emporium has several harbors which could be used according to the weather conditions and the organization of the emporium. In conclusion, the interplay between the micro-scale activities within the urban fabric and the macro-scale activity of the emporium define the form and operative planning of the port city of Delos. It is evident that the urban and economic expansion that Delos underwent in this period was unpredictable for the inhabitants of Delos. Even the new neighborhoods were not sufficient to accommodate the growing population and small scale economic activities on the island that grew because of the operation of the trading center. The numerous changes in the organization of the interior of the houses within the neighborhoods saw the constant effort to make the best of the available spaces near the harbor areas. These changes were implemented reactively in order to fit the needs of the inhabitants and their commercial activities, the scales of which was not foreseen. Nothing could indeed have predicted this enormous urban and economic expansion of Delos in this period. Neither the fame of the sanctuary, nor the quality of the harbors of Delos, nor the geographical position of the island. The decision of Rome to grant the island the status of a free port, combined with the destruction of Corinth, a powerful rival in 146 BC, as well as the intensification of the relation of Rome and Pergamon, for which Delos played an intermediary role, led to the development of the commercial cityscape of Delos. At the end of the second and beginning of the first centuries BC, Delos became a merchant city to embrace the concept of Max Weber, a city maintained by its commerce, whose organization and form were indeed shaped vis-a-vis -vis handling and shipping activities, as well as the microeconomy that developed alongside them. The urban development that Delos underwent in this period can be only understood in relation to both the operation of the Emporium, the long distance trade, and the macro scale economy that the Emporium generated within the urban fabric that you see here. Delos has no walk walls to mark its boundary or gates and tombs to point its entrance. The sea is the boundary and the harbors are the gates to the city of Delos. The coastline and harbors of Delos were the defining elements in the organization of the city, embodying Purcell's notion of the ora maritima, not as a mere geographical term, but the systematization of human resources, operating between the micro and the macro scale economic activities of the Emporium, the coastline of Delos defined and regulated the development of the city. Now, Whereas I focus on a specific case study of urban growth, my ultimate goal here is to offer an alternative approach to think about urbanism in classical antiquity. By examining the evolving agents, relationships, and consequences of the rapid urbanization on Delos, I aim to identify a model of urban growth that to date has been overlooked in the study of classical urbanism, which has focused on the idealized concept of hypodamian principles, for example. In this case, I adopted a bottom-up approach, examining the ways in which uncontrolled factors such as economic developments fit in our understanding of urbanism in classical antiquity. I hope that such an analysis will allow a deeper understanding of the urban form of Greek and Roman cities and move forward recent approaches to ancient cities as social constructed realities. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Shall I stop sharing? What's that? Shall I stop sharing? Uh, I think let's wait for the questions. There may be points where you want to refer back to particular photos. Um, I'm sorry we're not all in person, but I, uh, you could hear us all applauding. I'm very, at some point we will have to do that correctly. <laughs> now I have a page full of questions I'd like to ask Mantha, but before I get to that, does anyone else in the audience have questions they would like to ask? Anyone? You feel free to put them in the chat, please. Then I will get started. 
I think the first thing that struck me, and I don't know if anyone else noticed it, was the slave market offshore, that circular carousel of a slave market. And I know there's been sea level change, so the sea level has gone up slightly, maybe about a meter and a half or two meters since this was in use. But nevertheless, the fact that it was it's still offshore at the time, even with the rise in uh, sea, with the drop in sea level, or was it isolated by the water? What's happening there? Yeah, I'm sorry. So um, I didn't actually uh, go very much into analyzing the harbor. As I mentioned, the, the second survey uh, concentrated on the main harbor area and uh, the um, shipwreck survey that we did. So. Um, this area, as you see, it's not only the circular harbor, the circular, maybe actually this one is better. So um, you see here, this is a mole. Okay. And uh, all this was actually land. We know about a development in this area that, you know, there is uh, from the earlier, you know, uh, Hellenistic period, there is a development of, in fact, you know, Theophras is the, is the person, the Pimelitis, the uh, supervisor that, you know, sees to the completion of this project of creating a, a landfill there for the extension after, you know, uh, the Stoa. Mm, okay. The West. And so uh, what you see here, the, the edge of the harbor area will be here. And so this was not, it was at the edge of the city, but not in this, like, you know, it was, uh, yeah. Okay, so it was not isolated by the water itself in any way. And if you look, you know, there are structures here. These ones were not being able to identify so clearly, but, you know, some other further north, you know, we see um, a facade, you know, of houses, you know, further to the north. But, you know, uh, actually, this one must be a public building right there. Mm, okay. Um, actually, uh, no, this one. Excuse me. So, um, I don't have a good map to show you this, but you know, in general, you know, the area continues to the north, and you know, uh, we're now uh, focusing on the analysis of this, you know, data in order to interpret it. It's very uh, fragmentary and very uh, badly preserved because, precisely, um, further to the south. Let me, yeah, this. So. Um, this area here has been created. This uh, this is the modern pier, and this has been uh, basically built on top of the uh, archaeological uh, debris that was uh, thrown in the sea in the early excavations, and on top of which then they built you know uh, the pier, and uh, this uh, obviously has changed a lot of currents you know in the area, and um, has this you know has. You know, created a lot of you know destruction but at any rate you know the area was looking at, this is the red thing here you know so all this area here you must imagine it being more extended and um yeah imagine okay. it like you know the maritime facades that you see in the kind of like you know small you know pinakes in roman wall painting and so on mm -hmm. all right i can see small that. venice in 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 uh in mykonos also okay okay thank you well, we have a couple of questions and I'll be awkwardly reading them out. Um, this is from Charles Gates. He's curious if the challenges of freshwater management at Delos were mastered immediately or if they were rad, you know, gradually modified during the period that you examined. Well, um, the island had actually very good, you know, source of water. And of course, you know, I mean, very good. So there was a, a source of inopos that had like, you know, a current, you know, uh, that was actually brought into the city. And of course, there was a need for more. And that's why all the um, houses have, you know, big cisterns to store, you know, water. So they recognized, obviously, this, you know, need early on, and they created a network of, you know, water storage, you know, throughout the island. But there are sources that nowadays, of course, with a... Um, with the raising of the uh, relative, you know, with the relative, with the relative sea level change uh, uh, from antiquity, uh, we these sources now have been contaminated. And until you know, very recently, uh, the house of Cleopatra in the theater district had uh, very good water to drink from. But you know, it has no longer been. You know, it's no longer the case. Mm, I see. I see. And there's another question here from Barbara Burrell. Uh, she's curious if the how the sacred economy of Delos, you know, still a primary site for worshiping Apollo and Artemis, how that might factor into the island's development at this time. 
you know, did the main harbor and the nearby Agora fulfill what might be called a sacred function, such as pilgrimages or dedications as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I I kind of like emphasized more the the economic uh, and you know focused more on the merchandise on the merchant communities. But yeah, we do see an intensification of dedications in the dramas, and also within the sanctuary itself. You know, we have dedications of statues within the sanctuary peribolos as well. So there is uh, definitely uh, yeah uh, the the I mean the the standard like you know sort of. Uh, um, uh, um, article for this is Sheila Dillon's, you know, the uh, uh, analysis and Elizabeth Baltus, uh, the analysis of the dramas and the intensification of the dedications and uh, around along the dramas, but also in uh, the the appearance of uh, dedications within the sanctuary and clustering around uh, the uh, the porticos uh, of Antigonus, for example, uh, the new publication of. Uh, um, Fred Herbin, the second volume of the sanctuary, uh, will you know be focusing on those. Okay. I mean, that brings up a related question I have. I mean, you clearly have many more harbors in use at the time, and you've talked about how some of the harbors will be preferred by larger ships and some by smaller ships. Do you think there's just an increased sort of uh, specialization so that one particular harbor was always for more sanctuary work, more religious activities, whereas one was more for mercantile activities, small goods or large goods? Do you think it was that specialized or was it still an issue of the environment determining where the ships would go? Um, we don't have any epigraphic evidence su suggesting such specialization that you're referred at the, to at the beginning. So I, I, I will, um, I wouldn't go as far as saying that, okay. but um, I, uh, so um, there was before, you know, um, an idea, like a proposal that, you know, the, uh, the, the religious festival will actually approach from Skardanas to the main sanctuary uh, for the the Hyperborean uh, maidens will you know you know arrive at this uh, uh, bay of the Skardana district here. Um, so um, I take more of a um, you know this you know um, looking at the natural resource of the island and you know I do think that there, that was uh, uh, the more you know pragmatic sort of. Um, uh, you know, there is a pragmatic reason. There is no other indication, an epigraphic evidence that will indicate that. We do have a, a boundary stone of Oroston Macron Pleon, but uh, the military ships in the in the harbor. And uh, we think that, you know, this dates from the period of, you know, when there was, you know, this uh, um, need for having military ships in the harbor. One would, you know, assume that this will be there. And of course, it will also uh, indicate this. Uh, it will also uh, go well with the fact that this is a shallow harbor. Mm, yeah, I see that. Uh, we, have an, uh, we have a number of questions coming up. Uh, the next one from Harriet Weiss. She, well, it's, she says it's a wonderful talk. And so she's uh, basically asking, do we now think about the history and function of the longer known, better recognized and large scale economic buildings within this spatial economic development, the hypostyle hall and the agora of Italians? Like how, how do we think of them now as opposed to perhaps 10, 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, so there is, a, um, as, uh, as, as you probably know, there is this study of Monica Trumpe uh, on uh, the agora of the Italians and its interpretation as uh, um, a porticus with a garden and so on. And I, I think that it's actually sort of, you know, I think that we do see, you know, uh, architectural mannerism in, on the island that kind of like uh, lead to later developments we see in Italy. So I don't... Um, I, I, I would see it also as a multifunctional space, you know, uh, serving both the representation of the self, you know, uh, representation of the community, but also, you know, serving this, you know, uh, functions. Uh, and uh, the hypostyle hall has been recently studied by Jean-Charles Moretti and Miriam Finkia, and um, a person whose name uh, evades me in the team, who was a, um, a carpenter. Uh, so they have shown that, in fact, you know, this is an airy, you know, um, multi-columnar space that had, you know, uh, uh, that looks, you know, towards Rome in the sense that it has like this uh, tall, you know, airy spaces that we see uh, uh, in uh, the early basilica in Rome. So 
a commercial building again, definitely. So we have a series of them now uh, that you know we are able to see around the sanctuary. And of course, we have uh, the study of uh, Pavlos Cardonis and Jean-Jacques Malmarie of the commercial buildings to the south here, these ones. Uh, which are comparable to what we found here in the sea. And these, you know, uh, prove that there is um, uh, uh, intensification of storage spaces within them, as well as, you know, business activities taking place in, in them. And speaking to the point of religion, uh, we find also this, you know, uh, um, areas that are being, you know, marked with Lars Confitalis. So we see this, like, you know, uh, Italian merchants, like, you know, living in these areas as well. So this uh, multifunctionality is, you know, definitely the case. Okay. Okay. In fact, I have like you mentioned the the House of the Seals and the sixteen thousand examples. I think I have dozens and dozens of questions to ask you, but I won't take up everyone's time here. Uh, Lale Ozgenel actually has one more question. And she's asking if the density of the workshops found in the Delian houses is significantly higher than the density of domestic workshops found in other cities of the same period. That's a good question, Lana. Uh, thank you. Um, Um, from the Hellenistic period, I think, I mean, the thing is that, you know, I mean, the, the examples that we have well documented of, you know, and for such examples, you know, are, you know, Roman uh, cities for Hellen, I, I would say for the Hellenistic period, yes, I would say yes. Okay. okay. We don't have, you know, that many, like, you know, comparable kind of like, you know, sites, but I would say in relation to what we have, yes. And especially if you, I should also point out to the, um, to the actual sort of you know size of this um, uh, island, so uh, I will use this. Uh, so Delos is Delos. I'm sorry, I say usually Delos. But, uh, so it's roughly one kilometer to three and a half kilometers long. So if you see that density taking place in this you know uh, areas that I'm discussing, I think that may give you a scale of the kind of like intensification of that. But of course, in terms of Hellenistic, you know, housing and, you know, uh, urban is, you know, Delos is one of the kind of best, you know, examples that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, Inge has a, has a related question, in fact. She's curious if the economic activities in the houses are mainly focusing on the production of just one kind of item or if it's a combination of different types of production. Yeah, no, um, that's, uh, well, first of all, I pointed out to the fact that, you know, I, I focus on the House of the Seals because that's very well, you know, uh, well, you know, uh, documented. So we don't have that much evidence, but, you know, we see uh, production of oil and wine, definitely. Uh, and uh, then we have a lot of workshops. We have a number of workshops, marble, we have uh, glass workshops, we have other, you know, ceramic workshops and so on. Um, they're not usually combined at these ones, the marble, I would say, with, you know, the other, so, you know, we, they occupy one space. And, you know, in the case that we have found, you know, evidence for such, you know, workshops, we find them to be, uh, you know, the areas, you know, of these uh, are, you know, um, dedicated to that workshop. Okay. Okay. So are there any other questions? Yeah. Elif has raised her hand. Sorry, I just couldn't. Um, articulate well enough to write my question. So I'll just ask it. Um, uh, so it seems like the island functioned among many things uh, as a giant warehouse as well. Um, how, how much um, of the, uh, like, was there a lot of local production? Uh, was the landscape heavily used? Or uh, do we know anything about the other islands, uh, they were um, bringing in resources or materials from elsewhere to keep here for trade. How, how is that system understood or is it understood at all? <laughs> Lali, you asked the, the, like, you know, the most difficult question. Uh -huh. uh, so basically, um, you know, the island is tiny, as I pointed out. And, you know, of course, we know from the sources that, you know, this is like, you know, the you know, the trading point for so many things, right? Uh, for example, the bronzes. Um, uh, so um, we must, you know, uh, imagine that there is like, you know, um, 
there you know the, the materials are being brought from you know outside of course there are uh, they are using local stone uh, to build uh, and uh, they're querying you know locally we see this uh, in the early phases of the sanctuary there you know Parians, Naxians come and build with their stones, but in the Hellenistic period onwards, in fact, they start building with you know local stones from the either from from uh, Delos itself or you know from you know islands around. So, um, so they're making uh, do with what they have, let's say, you know, on the island for like you know you know constructing and so on, but definitely for you know the. Um, uh, the type of you know uh, microeconomic activity that we see, they must have brought you know resources from outside. Uh, definitely a place that to, you know, uh, as you you might know, but I will just stress that you know nobody uh, uh, is allowed to die on Delos. Nobody is allowed to be born on Delos in order not to die potentially. So um, uh, so um, there is uh, the essential you know island for the subsistence of Delos is Renia to its. Um, West. Let me find. So this, and in fact, you know, we know very few things nowadays. There is a new survey that is going around Renia to look at, you know, uh, the remains. There is a city there, and we do know that they have uh, 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 agriculture. Delos itself is also agriculture intensified. We see this in the uh, um, a variety of. Um, terracing walls that are created to the south of the island for, you know, the intensification of the agricultural activities. Uh, and uh, the whole south part of the island is full of farms that, you know, basically use that. So, what, you know, whatever is available, they're making, you know, uh, they're, yet, they're trying to use it, but it definitely relies heavily on Renia on the other side in terms of, you know, productivity. I should also note something like maybe, you know, sort of like trivial, but, you know, nowadays Mykonos, uh, uh, people from Mykonos have, farm still on Renia and they go and farm there. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so this is like, you know, this is an area that's, you know, um, fertile and so on. Okay. Thank so you. That, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to thank. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Elise. Mm. Well, that, that may have answered the next question from Elizabeth Kuluk. She's asking if there's any particular reason that we have this concentration of development and uh, commercial areas in the northern region of Delos as opposed to the south. And if there's some region in the south, it's just not conducive to that. Was it predominantly agricultural to hilly? What was going on? Yeah, I um, I guess, you know, there is a, maybe it's seen like, you know, yeah, actually this, uh, this area here, you, you see that there is like, you know, hilly area here and the area where the sanctuary first was settled, it was in this plain, you know, in between those two hills, let's say, or, you know, this area. And I guess, you know, um, there is the Asclepia on here and there are, there is development. There is afterwards, you know, as, you know, the city develops, it does stretch to the south, but it never goes beyond the Asclepion Bay, the so-called Furni Bay here. Uh, we have farms that go further south, the, the terracing walls are down here, so they use the island to intensify. And of course, you know, that's not uh, going to my earlier point about navigation. These points are not at all good to kind of like, you know, I mean, these are these are very hilly here. This is there is nothing to kind of like go to. I mean, th this area could have been used, but they, it never stretched that far down to kind of, you know, include that. They used, you know, the Asclepion to take boats and take people across to Rhenia to die there. The, 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 the oops, excuse me, the, the um, cemetery is across uh, on the other side of Rhenia. And uh, then, um, yeah, the development goes up to this point here, here. And uh, the new, um, as I said, um, the new survey has mapped all the remains and the, this analysis of drone images is trying to figure out, you know, what, how we can actually reconstruct the urban grid of the island, you know, on the, without actually excavating, which is actually pretty neat. Yeah, I like that. All right. So yeah, I mean, just to sum up, uh, sorry, Matthew, I think that you just said that the earlier occupation, the earlier like, you know, activity is in this area and then kind of like explodes from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, like I said, I think I'm going to be pestering you with questions later about the 16,000 seals. I want to learn more about those. But if we don't have any more questions this evening, I think it's time to let Monta go and relax and we can stop quizzing her about her research.